wrapping up a series today called Voices from the Crowd. All summer long, we've been going to Hebrews 11 and we've been listening to voices from people who are mentioned in Hebrews 11. It's called like the Hall of Fame of Faith, this, the uh, Heroes of Faith. They're all listed there in, in Hebrews 11. And we've been pulling someone out of the stands every week and just to what they would say to us today about living out our faith and how we respond to life today with our faith and our hope in Christ. And uh, we've been looking at Hebrews 11, and we'll just jump right in with it. He said, faith means being sure of the things we hope for and knowing that something is real, even if we don't see it. Faith is the reason we remember great people who lived in the past, and that's the people we've been talking about, these great people of faith in the past. He said, God was pleased with them, because of their faith. God was pleased in them because of the way they lived out their faith every day and how they exercised their faith. And then in chapter 12 of Hebrews, he says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great crowd of witnesses, these people who stood out in their faith for Christ, he said, we're surrounded by a crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. He said, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sins that so easily trip us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. I love He said, let us run with endurance. This tells me something right here. It tells me it's not a sprint. So often we just, oh yeah, let's just, and we go full guns and then we're, we're hassling, we're giving out of breath. But He said, we got to run with endurance, which tells me it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. It's something that we got to, to pace ourselves. We have to work at it. We have to, to, to go at it steadily. And He said, you've got to endure. And every week we make a lap. We've talked about pulling someone out of the stands and, and hearing different voices from this crowd of witnesses this, that has, has run the race and lived out their faith. We started with Moses, and Moses, as he was running a lap with us, he said, live in the faith zone and not the safe zone. Step out there. Sometimes you just got to step out in faith. It doesn't make any sense, and, and you can't explain it, but sometimes you just got to step out there, and you just got to do it. The next week we talked about Abraham, and Abraham said, always trust God to do what he says he'll do. Always trust him to do what he says when he does. Even if it doesn't make sense, even if it seems like it takes forever, he said, always trust God to do what he says he'll do. We talked about David. And David said, don't let your limitations be, become lids that keep you from doing what God has called you to do. He said, don't let other people put lids on you by saying, hey, you're not good enough, or you can't do this, or this isn't possible. He said, don't let people put lids on you. And then we talked about Joseph, and Joseph simply said, hey, never give up on the dream. Never give up on the dream. Never give up on what God has put in your heart to do. If God has put something there, he said, then you see it through. Don't ever give up on the dream. And then last week, if you were here, we talked about Peter. And what would Peter say to us if he came down and ran a lap around the track with us? What would be something that Peter would say to us? And, and we talked about Peter would say, your failures can never outweigh the infinite grace and the forgiveness of God. Your failures can never outweigh the infinite grace and forgiveness. God, doesn't matter how bad you've messed up. doesn't matter how bad you've sinned. doesn't matter how many times you've fallen. He said, you will never out the grace of God. So he said, it'll never outweigh the infinite grace of God. But as we're making this final lap today, and we're running this lap of faith, we hear another voice. But this voice is not coming from the crowd. We notice that they're all up there watching, and they've been coming down and running with us and speaking to us. But the voice we hear today is not a voice from the crowd. It's not someone sitting up in the stands. This voice is distinctly different. This voice is, is actually familiar this voice is not coming from the stands. This voice is coming from the finish line. And as we look and we listen, suddenly we realize it's Jesus. What would Jesus say to us about running this life of faith? What would Jesus say to us about living out our faith? I think, first of all, Jesus would say, hey, run. Just run. Just keep running. Just keep focus. Keep running. Keep enduring. Keep fighting. Fight to the finish. Keep running until you get to the end of the race. And we find this in Hebrews 12 too. He said, 
How do we live this life of faith? How do we keep enduring and running in this race? He said, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. Keeping our eyes on Jesus. How do we live out our faith daily? How do we make this work? How do we run this life of faith effectively? He said, you do it by keeping your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on the goal. Keep your eyes on the finish line. And you see, the problem we have today is we live in a world of distractions, don't we? There are, there's distractions going on all around us. I mean, I, I was coming home, it's been a couple of years ago, I was driving home from Atlanta one evening and was on the interstate, and there's this big black sign, you know what I'm talking about, the big black signs with the orange bulbs, the, the, they flash up warnings and construction and all this. Well, there's this monster big sign hanging over the side of the interstate, and it said, don't be distracted in driving. Don't text and drive. And I'm, you know, I'm doing this, and it's just flashing. And I'm thinking, what are they, you know, uh, don't be distracted. And you got this sign up there blinking saying, don't be distracted when you drive. We have distractions all around us. They're everywhere. What happens when you take your eyes off the road? If you're driving along, you take your eyes off the road, you begin to drift over into another lane. How many of you ever run over those little ripples on the side of the road. You know, they go, brum, brum, brum. you know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever run over those? Just me? Okay. They're annoying, aren't they? I, oh, I hate it. Just gets on my nerves. But you know what? They're there to give us a warning. They're there to say, hey, you're drifting dangerously close to the edge. You're about to get off track here. You're about to get off course. We're distracted by a lot of things. We're distracted by work. Workaholics, we just... That we just, everything's about work. We're distracted by school. We're distracted by ball or recreation. We get distracted by money and making more money and what we're going to do with our money. And we get distracted by relationships that aren't real good. And, and, and there's all kinds of things around us that are there to distract us from keeping our eyes on Jesus. And none of these things are bad things, but if we're not careful, we focus on them and it keeps us from focusing on the main thing. The main thing. And even religion, even church and religion can be a, a major distraction to us as we're running our life of faith. You go, well, that, wait a minute, we're in church. That doesn't sound very good that you're saying church and religion can be a distraction, but it can. We focus more on church and religion than we do on following Jesus. It becomes a big distraction. We get busy working in the church or we're serving or we're doing different things and, and we just get so caught up in that or, or we start debating people over theology and doctrine and what you believe and what I believe and pretty soon we have our eyes on who's in, who's out, where they should be, what they should be doing and pretty soon we're totally distracted and our eyes are off of Jesus. When you're running, whether it's physically or spiritually, if you're not watching the finish line, you're going to start drifting. You're going to start getting off just a little, just a little, not much, but you'll start slightly getting off track. I read this, I thought it was very interesting. It said if you're going somewhere and you're off course by just one degree, if you're off by just one degree at a foot distance, you'll miss your target by 0.02 inches. We think trivial, you know, I mean, uh, oh, two inches. I mean, you can't even measure that hardly. That's not even hardly noticeable. But as you begin to go farther out at 100 yards, if you're off by just one degree, at 100 yards, you'll be off by 5.2 feet. And that's still not huge. I mean, it's a little noticeable, but it's not that bad. We think, oh, yeah, it's okay. After a mile, you're off 92.2 feet from where you're intending to go. If you're traveling from San Francisco to Los Angeles, you'll be off by six miles. If you're trying to get from San Francisco to Washington, D.C., and you're off by just one degree, you'll end up on the other side of Baltimore, which is about 42.6 miles away. If you travel from Washington, D.C., around the globe, trying to get back to Washington, D.C., and you're just one degree off, you'll miss by 435 miles. You'll end up in Boston instead of Washington. If you're in a rocket going to the moon, 
you'll miss it by 4,169 miles, just being off one degree. If you're going to the sun, you'll miss it by 1.6 million miles. And if you're traveling to the nearest star and you're off just by one degree, you'll miss that star by 441 billion miles. One degree. Just a little bit off. But over time, one degree can cause eras in our direction by huge proportions. That's why the writer of Hebrews here, he says, keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on the goal. Keep your eyes on the finish line. Just keep your eyes locked on to Jesus. We can't afford to be one degree off. You may not notice it today. You may not notice it next week. You may begin to see a little bit of a sign in a month or two. But over the long haul, over the marathon, if you're off by one degree, you're going to miss the mark by a long way at the end. Keep your eyes on Jesus. If you want to know how to live out your faith every single day successfully, watch Jesus. Follow His lead. Follow His example. Why do we want to follow Him? Why do we, we need to follow His lead or example? Because it goes on and it says this, that He, or Jesus, He is the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Some translations say He's the author and the finisher of our faith. The literal meaning here is that Jesus is the founder and He is the designer of this race of faith that we're running. And as the leader or as the finisher, Jesus is meant to be followed. Jesus not only designed the race, He was the first one to complete the race. He was the first one to break the tape and to cross the finish line. So the writer says here, keep your eyes on Him. Focus on Him. Follow Him. Follow His lead. You want to know how to effectively run this life of faith? How to live out your faith every single day? He said, just watch Jesus. Follow Jesus. Simply put, if we we had to condense it into a statement, we could simply say this, live as He lived and do as He did. Live as Jesus lived and do as Jesus did. It is so interesting. You go back and read the Gospels when Jesus called His first people to follow Him, His first disciples, notice what He did. He didn't go up to them and say, okay, here's the rules, here's the requirements, you read through it, if you think you're up to it, sign on the line, you can be my my disciple. He didn't go up to people and say, okay, it depends on how you obey these commandments as to whether you're going to be my disciple or not. No, what he did is he went up to people and he'd say, hey, just follow me. You don't have to change anything. You don't have to believe. You don't have to sign on a covenant or anything. Just come on. Just follow me. Just look how I live and do, watch what I do. And he invited people to follow him. To focus on Him. If you follow someone, you've got to focus on them. If you follow someone, you've got to watch them. You've got to keep your eyes on them. You know, I, I don't know how it is with you. This is probably, this is just totally probably us, but I can go into a mall or I can go into a department store with my wife and we'll be in there and we're walking around and I'm, she says I'm, uh, is it 80, ADD, ADHD, I'm, one of those AD somethings. And so when we get in there and I'm walking along and all of a sudden I see, oh, that's, that's neat. And I walk in and it's just a second. I mean, it couldn't be more than 10 seconds. I'm over, I'm looking at, I turn around and she's gone. She's gone. I mean, there, there's nowhere in sight. And then I start this frantic search going through the department store or the mall and I'm looking far and I'm thinking, she, she's going to kill me. you know. And I, I'm looking around, I can't find her and suddenly I'll find her and she'll say, where have you been? And I'm like, I've been looking for you. And she, well, I've been right here. I just walked in a circle. I'm right here. It's hard to follow someone if you're not watching them. And this is where so many of us get tripped up. This is where so many of us get off track and, and eventually drop out of the race because we lose sight of who we're following. We start focusing on the rules. We start focusing on religion. 
We start focusing on how everybody else is doing and their business and where they should be. And then we wonder why we don't feel any closer to Jesus. And we don't feel any farther down the track. I want to reach the finish line. I want to get the prize. And Jesus said, look at me. Watch me. Follow me. If you take your kids out hiking or stuff, and, and uh, I've been across these little bridges before. I remember going as a kid with my parents, and, and we would, in the mountains, we'd cross these little trails, and they'd have these little logs laying over uh, rivers. And uh, you'd you know, walk the log over, and, and I can remember them saying, okay, come on, you know, I was scared to death, and I'd, I'd be out there on this log, and they'd, the, what they'd say is, don't look down, don't look down, look at me, just come here, look, look right here, look, just walk to me, look right here. And I think that's what Jesus is trying to say to us. As he says, hey, just look right here. Don't look down, don't, don't look, uh, just look at me right here. Just follow me. And then he gives us the why. He said, follow him because of the joy awaiting him. He endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Something just doesn't add up here. Because of the joy awaiting him. The cross was awaiting him. Getting beat half to death being ridiculed and mocked, spit on. That's what was awaiting him. And he says, for the joy that was awaiting him. Which tells me something. It tells me he wasn't looking at just the cross. He was looking at something far beyond that. He wasn't just looking at what was right in front of him. He was looking ahead to the finish line. He was looking to the completion. That's why he was able to endure he wasn't focused in on, the, on all that was happening right there. He was looking far beyond that. He was looking, okay, I'm already down at the finish line. I've, I've got the goal in sight. I've got the finish line in view. In the middle of the pain, in the middle of the suffering, in the middle of the humiliation and the darkness, his gaze is on the finish line and he's looking straight ahead to the finish. He's looking straight ahead to the completion. Because if he had focused on the wrong things, it would have been hard to endure. It would have been hard to endure. Keeping our focus. If he had focused on the pain, if he had focused on the, the mistreatment, if he had focused on the humiliation and the, the, the mocking and all the other things, if he had focused on revenge maybe, he's on the cross and, and he's up there taking names. He's like, okay, I, I see who, uh, yeah, you're part, you're part of it and you're part of this. You just wait. You just wait. You, you'll pay for this. You'll see who's... King of kings and Lord of lords. I mean, he could have been up there focusing on the revenge part. A lot of things he could have focused on. Yet, he focused on the finish. Keeping our focus on Jesus during the intense, trying times of our lives, it enables us to endure. It's usually when we begin to look around, we take our eyes off Jesus that we start to get fearful discouraged. We start getting a feeling of hopelessness. We start listening to the wrong people. We start looking at the wrong circumstances. We start wondering why everyone else seems so far ahead of us. You know, well, they're just way ahead. I don't understand why. And we get our focus off of Jesus. And pretty soon we've forgotten where we're going and who we're running toward. Jesus knew who and what awaited Him at the finish line. He never lost sight of that. Therefore, he was able to endure what seemed to be the darkest, toughest, most hopeless moments of his life. I've talked to some people who've endured some incredible hardships in their life. I've talked to some this week that are going through some incredible hardships. People who've lost their marriage, they've lost a spouse, or they've lost a child. They lost everything they own. They've lost a job or they lost their career or, or they lost their reputation. I've spoken with others who've lost through sickness that, that their body has taken a toll, it's taken a beating. They're weakened and they know that their days are numbered. Yet in the midst of such hardships, they have such an incredible peace. 
and joy. I've sat by the bedside of those whose body were fading, but their spirits were strong. How's that possible? They had their eyes on the goal. They had their eyes on the finish line, which enabled them to endure. And because Jesus kept His eye on the finish, and because He endured, the Scripture goes on to say, now He's seated in the place of honor besides God's throne. You see, there's a finish line, but there's also a reward for those who finish the race. I mean, imagine a race where there's no finish line. Imagine everybody gets up to the start line, and they're up there, and they go, ready, set, go. And we take off running, and we're like, okay, where's the finish line? And they go, well, there is, there's, no, there's no finish line. Just run. You know, we're, you know, we're running, running, and there's no finish line. There's no prize offered at the end because there's no finish line to cross. Let me just say something this morning. If, and this is a huge, huge if, if I run, I want to know there's a finish line. I want to know that there's a, a purpose. I want to know there's something to enjoy when I cross that finish line. So I run with purpose. I run with a goal. I run with a, a, a goal in sight, with knowing that there is a finish line. There's an end to this race. I don't want to just get out and run. In fact, let me just say this. If you see this pastor running, okay, if you see me out running somewhere in town, you can bet your life on one of three things. Either I'm on fire, either there's a wild animal after me, or either my wife is after me. And in the event of any of those three, would you please stop and pick up your pastor, okay? Because I just don't run. I don't get out and just run. I want to know there's a purpose. I want to know there's an ending. I want to know there's a, a goal to achieve. Jesus said the goal, the finish. He said, that's ahead. I ran, I endured, I finished. Now there is a reward, a place of honor besides God. So what's our reward for finishing this race? What's our reward? The first reward is heaven. Heaven. Think about this for a minute. We cross the finish line. We step in to heaven. No more sin. No more temptation. No more addictions to battle with. No more evil to conquer. No more death. No more mourning. No more grieving. No more standing at a graveside telling a loved one goodbye. No more of that heart-wrenching pain that we experience. Never saying goodbye again. Heaven is the reward. No heartbreak. You may have had your heart broken multiple times on this earth and throughout your life, but in heaven there is no heartbreak. There is no pain. There is no sickness. There is no suffering. There is no cancer. Thank God. No cancer, no leukemia, no dementia, no heart disease, no depression, no loneliness. In fact, the Scripture says that our minds can't even conceive what heaven is. Is like It can't even conceive what's on the other side of the finish line. So the reward is heaven. But there's also one other reward, the greatest reward. And that is we get to see Jesus. We get to see Jesus face to face. And we get to hear His words, well done. Jesus stands at the finish line with nail-pierced hands outstretched, beckoning us, come on, come on, don't give up, keep running, keep pushing, keep enduring, finish the race, come on, you can do this, I'm with you, my Spirit's empowering you, you just keep running, keep putting a foot in front of the other and finish the race. His arms are outstretched, ready to welcome us. The one who loved us so much that He gave Himself for us. He was beaten. He was mocked. He was crucified. He rose again. He stands at the finish line and He says, just keep your eyes on Me. Just look at Me. Just set your heart and your mind on Me and keep running. You're almost here. Don't quit. Don't give up. Keep running toward Me. You're closer than you can ever imagine. 
Each moment is a step taken. Each breath is a, a page turn. Each day is a mile marked. It's another lap. And with every lap, we're closer to the finish than we've ever been. And then the writer sums it all up here in verse 3. He says, think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people, then you won't become weary and give up. Basically what he says, hey, remember Jesus. Just remember how Jesus ran. How He endured. And how He finished. He said, and each time you start to cramp up and your legs feel like they're about to fall off, and each time that your, your lungs start burning and your heart feels like it's going to pound out of your chest and you're thinking, I can't put up with any more. I can't go any farther. Every time that life turns sideways, every time you're dealt a blow after blow after blow, and when it seems like you're farther from the finish line than you were when you started, when you think you just can't go on any further, when you think you're ready to drop out, that it's not worth it, that you can't take another step, he said, please, please, just remember Jesus. Keep your eye on Jesus. You see, because we all become weary, we all get tired and anxious, and we all, at some point, we all consider quitting and giving up. And the writer says, when you get to that point, when you consider quitting, when you consider dropping out of the race, he said, remember the words, the writer of Hebrews. And he says, keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished the race we're in. Study how he did it, because he never lost sight of where he was heading. That exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way, the cross, the shame, whatever, and now he's there in a place of honor right alongside God. When you find yourselves flagging in your faith, go over that story again and again, item by item, that long litany of hostility that he plowed through, that will shoot adrenaline into your soul. You see, here's the thing this morning. It doesn't matter how you started the race, and it doesn't matter how many times you've fallen and busted your face running the race. What matters is how you finish the race. Stay focused on Jesus. Endure hardship. And run and remember that there is a prize awaiting you. The Apostle Paul, he also ran and he finished this race we're talking about. He ran it well, by the way. And he's recounting to a young Timothy, a, one of his students. He's recounting to him the time that he spent on the track running this race of faith. And here's what he says in 2 Timothy. He said, I fought the good fight. I fought a good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. And now there's in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but to all those who have longed for His appearing. It started out well, but since we've stumbled, I started well, I started all fired up and ready to go, and I was like, yeah, I'll follow you to the ends of the earth, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. And I started with great zeal, but then there's been times that I've fallen and dropped and stumbled. And there's been times I've grown weary of running. I want to fight through every hardship, not to just say that I've fought through the hardship, but I want to start the race. I want to fight through the hardship. I want to finish the race. I want to finish strong. There's a lot of runners today, athletes who train hard and endure all kind of workouts and regiments and they put their body through so much. They work out hard and they train hard so that one day they may could run and that they could stretch their chest out and break a tape across the finish line somewhere in some race. I want to tell you that we train and we run not to break a tape, 
but we train and we run so that one day we can stretch out and we can run into the arms of Jesus. I run for the one who gave us all for me. And I run so that don't come up. I run this race so that one day, one day, one day I run and I see the finish. And I'm able to cross that line. And I'm able to hear what I long to hear more than anything else. And that is I long to hear my Creator, my Master, call my name and look at me and say, Chris, well done. Well ran. You stayed in the race. You could have quit anywhere along the way. But you stayed in the race. And you finished. Welcome home. 